So now we're moving on to ventilation, which again, like I said, ventilation is just a fancy term for breathing, right? And just like breathing has two phases of breathing in and breathing out, ventilation follows the same format, only the terminology is going to change a little bit. And so instead of saying breathing in, we say inspiration. And instead of breathing out, we say expiration. Right? And for both of these terms, we're focused just on the direction the air is moving. So inspiration, air moves into the lungs and expiration, air moves out of the lungs. Now ventilation is governed by Boyle's law, which says that at a constant temperature, the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to its volume. So if we have a decreased volume, we're gonna increase the pressure. And if we increase the volume, we're gonna decrease the pressure. And so if we look at the figure over here on the side, right, we have this nice square. And so if we expand out past that square without changing how much gas is inside of here, the pressure is going to decrease because those molecules of that gas are going to have more space to move around in. And the inverse is true down here. Right? If we push in on the sides, right, we're decreasing that volume and that's going to increase the pressure because the same molecules that are hanging out inside of here are going to be pushed closer together than they would normally be. Right? And so when we do that, that's going to force air out of the container. So inhalation, we're expanding that volume. Pressure drops inside the lungs, air can rush in. When we exhale, right, we're pushing in on those sides, we're decreasing that volume. Air pressure inside the lungs increases, and so that pushes air out. So in addition to Boyle's Law, we also have to look at some of these structures that are helping with this process. So when we're looking at inspiration, right, we're talking about breathing in. The diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles, these are muscles that you find with the ribs, between the ribs there. They're both going to contract. Right? And when the diaphragm contracts, it's going to flatten out and move down. The intercostal muscles are going to pull on that rib cage, moving it up and out. And so both of these actions are going to increase the size, increase the volume in the thoracic area in the chest. And so that's what we see here. We see that diaphragm. We see that diaphragm here. It moves down. It goes from a nice kind of curved C shape. It's going to flatten out and move down. As it does that, more space will be available here. These ribs move up and out. Again, more space all around. That means the pressure inside of these lungs is going to decrease, and so air will rush inside. With expiration or breathing out, it's the exact opposite. The diaphragm and the intercostal muscles are going to relax, which is going to bring the rib cage down and in. And the diaphragm will move back upward in that nice C shape. When this happens, the lungs kind of recoil inward. The pressure is going to increase inside of them, and that's going to push the air out. Now, remember, we said that there's a surfactant that's going to keep those alveoli from collapsing. So while we're pushing air out, we're not going to fully collapse in on ourselves. Right, and so this is what we see here again, just like what we saw in the last picture, we're seeing it in reverse. We're seeing the rib cage move down and in, the diaphragm relaxes and moves back up. This entire space here is going to shrink. And because of that, the pressure inside the lungs increases. And so air is pushed out of the lungs. Now, when we're measuring how much air is exchanged during ventilation, there's a few terms we can use. Tidal volume is just the normal amount of air that you breathe. So when you're breathing normally and you're not necessarily thinking about breathing, how much you breathe in and how much you breathe out is called your tidal volume. Think about like the tides of the ocean. The vital capacity is going to be the maximum you can breathe in plus the maximum you can breathe out during one breath. So if you took everything you could in, <gasps> everything you can out, <gasps> that huge jump from all the way to your top peak to the very low valley would be your vital capacity. 
any air above the amount that you can breathe in normally would be your inspiratory reserve volume. And anything extra you can breathe out past what you would breathe out your normal breath is the expiratory reserve volume. So inspiratory and expiratory reserve volumes are just the amount that you can breathe beyond the tidal volume. And so that's what we see here. So we have these nice smooth kind of in and out, in and out. That's your tidal volume. Maximum inspiration. Anything above that tidal volume is inspiratory reserve volume. Breathe everything out. Everything that we can breathe out past tidal volume is expiratory reserve. And then the combination of your inspiratory, expiratory reserve volumes and tidal volume is all your vital capacity. So again, max in, max out is vital capacity. Now, you can't actually breathe out everything in your lungs. There will be some air remaining, and we call that the residual volume. So how do we control ventilation? There's a few ways we can control it and a few different body systems involved. One is the nervous system. The nervous system most definitely has some control over ventilation. When we look at the brain, uh, we look at nerve signals that are going to tell us to breathe in. They're going to cause inspiration to happen. So we send out a signal to tell the intercostal muscles to contract, to tell the diaphragm to contract. And when we tell these muscles to contract, that's when we see that expansion in the thoracic cavity. And that expansion allows us to breathe in. When the signal stops, these muscles are going to relax. They shrink back in. We have less space available in the lungs. Pressure goes up, and so we breathe out. The brain is not the only thing controlling breathing, though. We also have chemical controls involved with breathing. So during cellular respiration, any cell we, you look at is going to be producing carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide is not going to hang around those cells. It's going to make its way into the blood. When it does that, though, we form an acid that's going to break down and give off hydrogen ions. And so the pH of the blood, when CO2 enters, is actually going to drop. Because there's a change in pH, that's a get, that gives us something to detect. And so we actually have two sets of chemoreceptors. Uh, chemoreceptors are receptors from the nervous system that detect chemical changes. And we'll talk more about those when we get to the senses. But these chemoreceptors are sensitive to changes in pH. And so if the pH drops too low, that can tell us that we need to breathe faster. We need breathing to speed up. And the idea is that if we speed up breathing, we're going to be able to get rid of more carbon dioxide. The more carbon dioxide we get rid of, we can go back to a more normal pH at that point. So like I mentioned, pH decreases in the blood. The respiratory center then is going to receive that message from these chemoreceptors, and it's going to tell you to breathe faster and deeper. Now, you probably noticed, you could try it right now if you wanted to, um, if you were to hold your breath, right? you're not able to exhale and get rid of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide would start to build up in your bloodstream, therefore decreasing the pH in your blood. But how long can you really hold your breath? How does it start to feel? So even though you can override this for a little bit, eventually you're going to feel that need, that deep desire to take a breath. When we look a little deeper, we're looking at our respiration, not just with the lungs, but just over the entire body. We're looking at the gas exchanges that are happening throughout the body. We really need to focus on the principles of diffusion. Oxygen and carbon dioxide, when they enter and leave the blood, it's going to depend on what we call partial pressures. So the, that's the amount of pressure that each gas can exert. And so we see that as PCO2 and PO2. Since we're following the principles of diffusion, we're going from a high partial pressure to a low partial pressure. That's the direction of movement here. So when we look at external respiration, 
this is a little bit of a misnomer because you think external respiration, you think something happening outside of your body, but in reality, we're talking about the lungs. We're talking about exchanging gases from the body to the air that's going to be in the outside world. So pay attention to the external versus internal respiration terms because they can be a little confusing. When we're looking at exchange of gases in the alveoli and in the capillaries, we need to look at the partial pressures of carbon dioxide and oxygen. It turns out that the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is higher in the capillaries compared to the air. And since we're following diffusion, we're going from a high to low, carbon dioxide will diffuse out of the capillaries and blood into the alveoli, which have that air with the low partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Now, most of the carbon dioxide we carry around is actually not in the form of carbon dioxide. It's in the form of bicarbonate. And so we see the reaction down below. We see that bicarbonate can pull up hydrogen ions to form what's called carbonic acid. And then we can break it down back into water and carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide then is what's going to be released into the air and exhaled out. The reverse is true for oxygen. There's a high partial pressure of oxygen in the air and a low partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. Since we're going from high to low, oxygen will move from the air into the bloodstream. Right? When it does this, it's going to bind with hemoglobin, which gives us oxyhemoglobin in the blood. So external respiration we just talked about, that's all talking about what's happening in the lungs themselves. How are we diffusing these gases to and from the air and the lungs? But it's not the only place where we see this diffusion or we see these, this exchange of gases. We also see it in the tissues. And so when we're looking at the tissues, we call this internal respiration. So a little bit different. Now we're trying to give up the oxygen and we're trying to pick up the carbon dioxide. Same concept though, we're going from high to low. There's a high partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. There's a low partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues. And so oxygen diffuses out of the blood into the tissues. And the reason why it's so low in the tissues is because the cells are using this oxygen all the time. It's getting used up faster than it can arrive sometimes. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, is being produced through cellular respiration. And so there's a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the tissues, what we call the interstitial fluid. Since there's a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the tissues, that means there, there's a low partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood. Again, high to low. So carbon dioxide moves from the tissues into the bloodstream. Right, and so this is what we're seeing. Right. In the lungs, we have, we're going from high to low no matter what we're talking about. In the lungs, the high uh, partial pressure of oxygen is going to be in the air, and so we move from the air into the lungs, into the blood. Carbon dioxide is the opposite. The high partial pressure is in the blood, and so we get pushed out into the air. The tissues, it's the exact opposite high partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the tissue, so we push carbon dioxide into the blood, high partial pressure of oxygen in the blood, we push it into the tissues.